welcome to Falls Baptist Church this morning. Great to have each one of you here. We are so excited to worship the Lord this morning. Over the next several weeks, last week was uh, Easter, and this is a special time of the year, but the next few weeks we're going to be actually taking our Sunday morning worship services and really focusing on the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ and that, that from that first interaction uh, that the followers had of Jesus after the, after the resurrection was with the angel. And he said, fear not. He said, go and he tell, tell others that Jesus is risen. And the Lord Jesus' first appearance was to Mary Magdalene herself. And he, she immediately went and told the others that Jesus was alive. And the last words of our Savior on this earth, four days later, he gave the same commission, go and tell. And you know, Christian, this morning, if the cross and the victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ has changed your life, then you can't help but tell others about it. And this morning, we're going to have the theme of I must tell. And we just sang, the, the choir just sang, Jesus saves. We're saying, we're speaking to people about the glorious salvation that we have. Turn your hymn books, please, to 430. 430. The title is, O Zion Haste. We're going to change those first three words as we do now to, O Church Arise. And this, this hymn here speaks of that glorious message that we have to proclaim the truth that Jesus saves and the passion that our church should have to get the gospel to every creature. It's exciting this morning. Let's sing about it and worship him. Number 430, please stand as we sing. sharp about the need that's all around the world in giving not just our wealth but look at that first phrase give of thy sons give it yourself and uh, I would sing that since growing up it didn't really mean something and now I have sons plural and it means something am I willing to give not just give them to go give the gospel to give them to give their lives for the gospel are we that passionate about giving the glad tidings to the world that needs it. On the last verse, give my
2,000 years ago, a dark cloud was hanging over the lives of the disciples and those that had loved the Lord Jesus. He had died. And it was a time in which their hopes had been dashed. They didn't know where to turn, even though he had already told them what he was going to do. But then the news began to come. He is risen. And then many of them saw him alive. And my friends, that reality spread like wildfire throughout Jerusalem. That testimony stirred people. And before just a matter of weeks was over, you had at least 8,000, if not many, many more than that, who had already come to Christ in that city that had so opposed Jesus Christ. All the testimony, he is alive, makes all the difference. And my friends, in this day, we need to have that same burden. And that's what our heart cry is going to be uh, to catch the heart cry of the Savior here. We need to catch today by the Spirit of God is that we need to be just as excited he is risen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do pray you'll touch our hearts. Lord, we need quickening all the time to uh, get out of just the pressures of life and the day-to-day -day lifestyle that we have. And Lord, help us to genuinely be moved by and transformed by the truth that Jesus Christ has, uh, has come out of that grave and that we have eternal salvation. Oh, Lord, do what only you can do. Bless this service now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
question for all of us. The song said, I love to tell the story. Do we? Do we love to say it? We love to say a lot of things, don't we? Love to talk about a score that went our way. Love to talk about a circumstance that was amazing, a trip that we took, the weather, anything. We get excited about it. Do we love to tell the story, the most important story? Take your hymn books, please, number 424. As we tell that story, you need to send the light out to the dark world. The story is the only light that can light up this dark world. Number 424, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let's stand, please, as we sing. There's a call upon me. speak of is the strength that gives us his strength for us to give this message out let us not grow weary it's nothing we can do we depend on his strength to give that on that last verse let us not grow weary singing you may be seated as the ushers turn and go to the back if you have not received a bulletin today uh, please raise your hand let them get uh, into your hands this morning a bulletin and inside the bulletin are a few important things if you're a guest here at Falls Baptist Church this morning we are so excited that you are here we'd like you to fill out a connection card in the bulletin and uh, put that in the if, uh, in the uh, offering plate when it passes in just a few minutes and that connection card will help us be able to really connect with you and be able to be a blessing to you. Uh, we're so thankful you're here. After the service as well, if you're a guest, please back there at the guest services, we have a gift for you and we'd love to give you as well. Also in, those, in the uh, bulletin is your sermon notes. So don't forget to have that. And uh, we just are so excited. I hope you are excited to serve the Lord this morning, to worship the Lord this morning, and uh, thankful you're here at Falls Baptist Church. Let us know. If you're a guest, let us know. We can do to be a blessing to you this morning. Amen. Well, we have a number of things here to talk about for just a few minutes this morning. First of all, the uh, theme of these next few weeks. I have been deeply burdened after coming out of Easter that we would indeed be a New Testament assembly that would respond to truth as we ought to respond to it. I was deeply moved being right in the middle of the whole presentation on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And friends, there's nothing more thrilling in all the world than to know that our Savior, the Creator of Heaven, came to this earth and lived here for us and died on that cross, but He didn't stay on that cross. He did not stay in the tomb. He is uh, risen from the grave, and He is the victor. As I said at the beginning of the service, uh, what a thrilling thing that was for the folks there to realize their Savior was alive. And my friends, our Savior is alive. And everybody needs to know that He is. As the Apostle Paul said, I am debtor to everyone. He named the different groupings of people in that day. And so as our theme for the month of April into May uh, is, uh, I must tell, I, I trust that we will respond to that as on a regular basis, this ought to be just in our hearts and on our lips. 
Um, we cannot, we cannot but speak the things that we've seen and heard. But the issue for all of us is that we need to be seeing and hearing it all the time in our walk with God. And if we're walking with the Lord, we cannot help but talk about our Savior. And so I trust that you will ask the Lord, as I'm asking the Lord, to just burn this within our hearts and uh, encourage you to be part of outreach in these days ahead. Ushers, if you'll come, we have some cards here uh, for uh, you, uh, you receive those in your adult uh, fellowships, but uh, if I could have one of those also there, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, you receive these, and this is simply a way to uh, uh, organize ourselves and uh, just to confront us with the need to make a decision about, uh, I must uh, tell, outreach commitment. And f by the grace of God, for the next five weeks, I commit, and then it gives the different things there. And what we're encouraging all of our folks to do is to, through your Sunday school, through your adult fellowship Bible studies, to have a partner uh, to allow your division leader or your fellowship director to partner you or you know someone there that you'd like to partner with and uh, to just make the commitment as best you can over these next five weeks uh, to make a special emphasis to tell the story of uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe in all my years of ministry, I've never seen people in our area more sensitive and more uh, open to the truth of uh, what Christ has done. Folks, I don't have to explain. I think everybody knows we're in trouble. That's not an exaggeration. I'm not being sensational. For the first time, I believe there is a true sense that it's not just a temporary emergency that America's facing, we are facing a long-term emergency. But there is all, there is great, what should I say, the answers are in Jesus Christ and in the Word of God. And folks, we have an opportunity that is priceless right now to get the news out that there is an answer in Christ, in the Word of God. And so I do want to encourage you to be, uh, help us out as we follow up with the guests that were with us for the Easter services. What a tremendous group of people we had. It was just a miracle how God worked in those two uh, services. And then to reach out to your own Bible studies top five list and then the different other names that each of your Bible studies have and to just believe God, praying it through and just allowing Him to stir you and guide you to reach folks with the truth and to see God do lasting, uh, just a lasting miracle. We just started our starting point class uh, this morning and to hear the testimonies again of how people just been saved in the last few months. I, I, I can never get over that. I mean, there's, that's the sweetest testimony you're, you're going to ever hear. Someone that was heading to face the wrath of God now is heading to be with the Lord in heaven forever and ever. There's nothing more thrilling than that. And so we all need to be involved in that. So I do want to encourage you uh, to just simply make a commitment and uh, put your name down if you know your fellowship or division to put that down. And then if you have a partner, great. Or if you need a partner and we will get organized. But I, I don't know of anything more important to the Lord Jesus in these next few weeks than for us to take what God has done here and to follow through and to see God do a mighty work. So I'll be touching on that in a few minutes in the message, but uh, I do encourage you to be praying about that. All right, we do have coming up uh, some very special events. And um, coming up, uh, not this week, but the next week, uh, it's going to be a week that um, I just encourage you to take advantage of everything that's going on. First of all, that week, on the 16th of April, Tuesday at 7 p.m. at the Sharon Lynn Wilson Center, the Academy's 40th anniversary and the Music School's 30th anniversary is going to be combined in a major anniversary concert. And uh, we are also going to be having internationally acclaimed pianist Sam Rotman uh, in that concert. And that's a great venue to, uh, to, to hear tremendous music. And it will be a great blessing. And we're looking forward. We've been inviting folks from our community even for that. And if you look on your 
uh, connection card, you can go ahead and uh, sign up for that. And uh, the number that you would plan on attending, but there is no charge for the concert, but we do need, if you can all possible, sign up for it so that we, because uh, tickets are given out for this by the Wilson Center. And if you'd like balcony seating uh, and so forth, so uh, just let, uh, or main seating, just put down that information there on the card and that we will have that prepared and the tickets ready for you uh, for that concert. That is just a week from Tuesday, so we do encourage you uh, to be there for that special time. And then on Wednesday night, we have uh, Sam Wilson with us from IBJM, and he's going to be doing what he did a couple years ago, and he's going to be going through the elements of the Passover and teaching us on that again. We had Brother Rotman last year, Brother Wilson the year before that. And, uh, but you know, there's a lot to remember in this. And I know that that will be very eye-opening for you. Next Sunday night, we'll have the Lord's table. And so you'll be able to see how the elements of the Lord's table came from the Passover. And he'll be showing you that and the meaning of that. So that's a week from this Wednesday night. And then on Friday, I told you it's a full week, we are having our annual Monroe Parker Lecture Series for Baptist Theological Seminary. And uh, it says Sam Wilson and Sam Rotman. It's mainly Sam Wilson, so I want to make that clear. He is going to be uh, giving you a Jewish perspective on what is happening in Israel, understanding Israel in troubled times. And he has a front row seat, uh, so to speak, in the, in the work that he does. And uh, so... Uh, I, uh, that's going to be quite a day. It'll start at 9 o'clock and will be done, I think, at 2 o'clock that afternoon. And uh, it's a wonderful day. And it'll be mainly, as I said, Sam Wilson, I, Brother Rotman. We were having, a, I was talking to Brother Wilson, and I said, yeah, we've got First and Second Samuel with us here. Uh, but anyway, I don't know who's first or second, sorry, but rather corny joke, but uh, two Sams here, and they're both uh, characters, so it ought to be an interesting week, the two of them combined. Uh, but uh, you want to plan to be with us for that. That will be a very special day. And then that night, we have a uh, 30th anniversary for the music school dinner gala. This is a, um, uh, this will uh, ha has a cost uh, to it, and all the proceeds will go towards supporting the music school and, uh, and our educational program. And it'll be a tremendous uh, uh, gourmet dinner with exquisite music and be a tremendous help. And I know you'd enjoy it. And again, uh, Sam Rotman will be uh, performing that night along with others. And uh, that will be a very special evening. And uh, so you can purchase tickets. You can see there uh, the address there in the bulletin that you can go on the website and get tickets for that. So. Lots of good things happening a week from this week. So I did want to make that clear to you and encourage you especially to sign up on the uh, connection card uh, with the concert a week from Tuesday night. All right, another big thing coming before we know it is the weekend of uh, April 26 and 27. We're excited about having Dr. Andy Gashke with us. Uh, pastor from Bloomington, Indiana, just a tremendous blessing, graduate of our academy and has been just a uh, great encouragement to us over the years, God's blessing his ministry and uh, he's going to be preaching and we've got a great uh, uh, men's retreat planned and the, you can sign up at the table. There are, uh, in fact, we have the brochures, yes, Jim, uh, gentlemen come and just pass those to the men here and uh, pass those out freely. And you can get the information there. I would encourage you to sign up. We look forward uh, to that time. All right. Um, I think those will be the only, because we have so many things. I'm not going to mention some of the other matters. I do encourage you uh, to look at that. We will have our BCMI uh, going, coming back on again, uh, resuming here this uh, today at 5 o'clock. So we encourage you to be uh, part of that if you've been in those courses. And uh, by the way, you can sign up for the men's retreat on the connection card. All right, lots of things there, but uh, we do want to clarify that for you. Did want to mention a couple of things for prayer. First of all, one of our members here, Janice Davis, went home to be with the Lord on Thursday. She had severe heart troubles and 
Uh, it uh, still was a, a surprise when the Lord took her. And uh, I would encourage you to pray for the family. Elmira, her sister, who is Gan Melton's uh, mother, they are all part of our church. Our, they have a small family unit, and this is a very a major time for them, and a major loss for them. So we would certainly appreciate uh, your prayer. There will be probably next week a funeral here. Uh, at the church. They have not yet decided on the time, so we will communicate that to you once we get that. And, um, and so do pray uh, for them uh, in that regard. And Sue McKinster's mother went home to be with the Lord this week, and also pray for this dear family. These are always major losses, and uh, just ask God to work there. All right, ushers come. Let's take our offering here this morning, let's stand for a word of prayer. Pastor Zimple, if you'll lead us, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for new life in Christ. We're thankful for all you've given us through your Son, his life and death and resurrection and ascension on our behalf. We're blessed to think today we can give to you. We can, we can serve you with our lives, and uh, we're thankful for that. Think of these ones who have lost loved ones and uh, just pray that your peace and comfort would be very real and present for them in this difficult time. And now, Lord, as we're giving in this offering, we pray, we ask that uh, you'd bless each gift, each giver, allow that these gifts would be multiplied in your hands and that each need would be met. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> joyfully enlisting 
to the Savior's side, to the to giving our lives for him. It fits perfectly with what we're talking about with I Must Tell, going out and giving the gospel. Take your hymn books, please. One last song this morning, 436. 436 in your hymn books this morning. Bring them in. Bring the wandering ones to Jesus. Let's stand once more this morning, 436. Heart is the shepherd's voice I hear Out in the desert, dark and drear Calling the sheep who would not astray Far from the shepherd's fold away Bring them in, bring them in Bring them in from the fields of sin
The newspaper a while back told of a soft-spoken young man who was a commuter on the Long Island Railroad. He was on the 5 o'clock local every day. The unique fact about him was that every evening after the train had left the subway, he would begin a journey uh, through the cars from front to back. And at each step, uh, each seat, he would stop and say, excuse me, but if any of your friends are blind, tell them to consult Dr. Garrel. He restored my sight. You see, something so dramatic in this young man's life occurred that even though he was shy and soft-spoken, he felt obligated to his friends that were blind to get the news out that this man could help. Well, that ought to be how we as the people of God feel when we think of what God has done for us. Yes, it's a major thing to be able to have sight when you've been blind. But it's a huge thing beyond, beyond my ability to describe to have eternal life when you did not have when you do not have it. And so what we want to look at today is the importance of the fact that we must speak the things that we know, the things that have changed us, the things that are dear to us. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24, if you would. Luke chapter 24, it's one of the great accounts of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're not going to be looking at that account, though it's a wonderful account and many things occur there. But we've got to ask ourselves the question, why do Christians struggle so much with communicating what is so thrilling? Uh, what uh, allowed these disciples to go from fear to confidence? These disciples, we find them uh, in the upper room with a locked door, having a guard, making sure that no one knew where they were. They were absolutely paralyzed by fear. In John 20, 19, we read, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be still. They were afraid. And you can understand, for the Roman government had allowed the Sanhedrin to prevail, and Jesus was put on the cross. And uh, it was a terrifying time for them. I told this story about how a woman in East Africa uh, tells how she heard the shrieks of terror from a bird. She looked out her window, and there was a bird transfixed with fear on a limb, his wings lifted up to fly, but for some reason unable to do so. Well, she watched as it lifted one foot and then the other, but its wings would not work. Then she saw a black snake, a black mamba probably, gliding slowly up the branch with its eyes fastened on the bird. Now let me stop here. How many of you in a dream have uh, had something that was scary and you couldn't move? Anybody ever have that? Okay, maybe I'm not, okay, I'm not the only one. That makes me feel good. You just can't move. Well, I feel, feel for the bird, uh, paralyzed with fear. But just the moment before the uh, uh, snake was going to get there, her husband shot his gun, and with the crack of the gun, it freed the bird, and he flew and was... Uh, able to not have his demise by the uh, fangs of that snake. Fear is really a, a major problem. You know, when it comes to that which should be the most glorious thing for us to talk about, it's almost like we're in a dream or like this bird. It just, for some reason, we have a fear that paralyzes us. Well, there is a snake, a serpent, Satan, that does everything he can to stop the testimony of God's people from going forth. And honestly, it is a fear, when you think about it, that uh, is tragic. Oliver Hazard uh, Perry uh, suffered a psychological 
fear of uh, cows. He would not even cross the road to avoid uh, passing a cow. Yet this is the very same man that audaciously and fearlessly directed the American fleet against the British on the Great Lakes in the War of 1812. In fact, in the midst of the battle, his ship was disabled and he got in another uh, and rode uh, from it to another to keep his command afloat. He was petrified of cows, but not of guns. That's unique. Uh, but you know, Satan can get us and just our own self. We can get petrified in this area where in other areas we're very, very confident. And here you see uh, the disciples, and we're going to look at the key reasons for this and then the need for us to overcome by the Spirit of God this kind of fear. If you look with me at chapter 24 of Luke, after we have the account of the resurrection, and then of the Lord meeting the disciples on the road to Emmaus, those two men, Cleopas and his friend, he then comes back to the upper room. And uh, we read in verse 36 of chapter 24, and as they thus spake, Jesus stood in the midst of them and said unto them, peace be unto you. Now, when it says that he stood in the midst, he did not uh, unlock the door and come in. He came in through the door. And uh, they were um, very much uh, affected by that. And then we read in verse 37, but they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Well, the first thing I want us to see here, we need to realize that understanding what Christ has done is a spiritual reality. You can know the facts. All around the world, people knew the facts that Jesus died on the cross and that Jesus rose again. Whether they believe it or not, they still knew the facts. Many people know the facts, but do not understand the spiritual reality of what that means. And even believers can become paralyzed when it is, comes to this matter of articulating, witnessing, telling the truth of what Jesus Christ has done because they are not in a spiritual mindset. And when we're not, then the blindness of unbelief can grab a hold of us. When the Lord met with them, we find in Mark 16, 14, the, uh, we read, uh, Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and abraded them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So we're talking about the same incidents here, but from different standpoints. And the Lord abrades the disciples for their unbelief. Now remember, he had clearly prophesied that he was going to die on a cross and that three days later he was going to come out of that grave. They knew that, plus he's going to, as we'll see here in a moment, go over the Old Testament scriptures, but their fear, and here's what I want you to, to get, and it's something that sometimes we're not willing to accept, so often our fear to do what we ought to do comes out of unbelief in what God can do in us because we are not thinking spiritually. Uh, Hebrews 3.19, unbelief keeps us out of victory. So then, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. There's the unbelief that God cannot use us. There's the unbelief that lost people are not going to be able to understand what we are saying or they're going to oppose us. There's unbelief that we will have the power we need and the clarity we need to, to give forth the truth. And all of that will paralyze us in doing the most important thing to the heart of the Lord Jesus. And I, let me just say, everybody in this room has the same issue. And those who get victory over uh, fear of telling 
the news of the resurrection are those that's, that start really believing God will do what he said he will do. The Spirit of God will convince of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That the power of the Spirit of God will be upon us to do what we cannot do. And so unbelief. In fact, it's uh, George Bowen said, speaking of unbelief, but it is the sin of sins. And until you learn to hate it above all sins, there is little hope of your deliverance from sin. The way to war with all other sins is to war with unbelief. For the life of every sin is hid in unbelief. And if you slay this last, you shall slay all. And how true it is. Now remember, unbelief sends people to an eternal judgment. Revelation 21.6 says, But the fearful and unbelieving, and it goes on and says, Shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Salvation is not work. Salvation is faith in the finished work of Christ, realizing that only He can save us from our sins. And when we put our faith alone in Him, God does uh, for us what we cannot do and imputes to us the righteousness of Christ, forgives us of our sins because of the victory of Jesus Christ, and gives to us everlasting life. That's an exciting, that's an exciting reality, isn't it? Well, that's because of faith, but if you don't believe. You see how unbelief is the sin of sins. Unbelief for a believer, for a Christian, that God can deliver you from sin. God can deliver anyone from any sin in this room here this morning. He is able to do so. The victory on the cross not only assures eternal life, but it assures victory over sin if we will, if we will trust Him. And so... When you get down to the matter of struggling with really uh, doing what God wants us to do, we need to realize that that paralysis of fear really does come from unbelief in what God can do uh, in our life. In verse 38, he says there, and he said unto them, why are ye troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? You see, the whole human earthly um, thought process is what gets us into trouble. And what he was going to try, what he was going to do here was get them off of a human perspective onto a spirit, uh, a spiritual perspective through the power of the Spirit of God. And he was going to do it by revealing himself. Now, have you ever wondered why initially, like Mary Magdalene, the ladies, and then the disciples themselves struggled a little bit knowing it was Jesus. And then they realized it truly was Jesus. Well, the problem was they were thinking from a very earthly standpoint and Jesus was now completely spiritual. Now, he had a physical body. The elements of his body when he died were the very elements in his body as he stood before them. But now he was no longer contained by his physical uh, uh, human limitations, obviously his spirit was still God, but now the spiritual reality because of the victory of the cross is what shone through and was hard for human eyes and minds to comprehend. Now this is a little bit of a heavy quote, but I'd like you to think through this one with me by George Reith. Jesus came among them in such a way as to prove the new, that new laws now held his body that the earthly no longer was a limitation to it. The spiritual in the man Christ Jesus had assumed complete control over the material. There was still a material element in matter and force. He had a resurrected body. The body of our Lord was therefore a spiritual, transfigured, glorified body. He was still man in integrity, even wearing the traces of his earthly uh, career, proving the identity of his person by the scars of crucifixion as well as the substantiality of his body by asking to be handled. In other words, they could feel him. He was physical. But he was no longer a living soul under the restriction and curse of Adamic descent. He was a quickening spirit, the second man, the Lord from heaven. Now, there's a lot in that paragraph. But the point is here, folks, that for us... To come to a place 
to be like the disciples were after Pentecost, to declare the resurrection with such force, we've got to be living in the spiritual mindset that understands what Christ has done, who he is, what that means to us, where he is now, how he is working through his body, through his church here, and to be able to have our, our eyes spiritually illumined. You see, if we're just living a normal human life, believers, and we're not walking with the, with the Lord, the Spirit of God is not taking truth and illuminating our minds and hearts, well, we lose the, the oomph to give out the gospel. And we fall into unbelief. I hope you're following me on this. This is a little heavier than normal, but I want you to get this. Because it, Christians can be very sincere and know they ought to witness but it's not a stirring, driving force in them. And I want to submit to you, it's because of unbelief that comes because we're not thinking spiritually primarily, we are thinking humanly primarily. We're not living in the spirit, we're living in the flesh far too much, which means when we look at the human scenario of giving out the gospel, human thinking can allow unbelief to come in very easily. If you look with me at the next uh, uh, couple of verses here, verse 39, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they were struggling, but did you notice something was beginning to happen? As they were beginning to think spiritually, joy came. Folks, let me just say, joy is contagious. When you get excited about the things of God, when the reality of who Jesus Christ is becomes even more spiritually real in your heart, when the Word of God leaps off the page and it applies to your life and you see God work exactly as He said He would work, joy floods your soul. And my friend, when joy floods your soul, you can't help but talk about it. Because we like to talk about things that make us happy, right? You know, for Christians, let me just be real blunt here. For all the times Christians, our Christian life sometimes seems to hold us back. Folks, no Christian life has ever made anybody unhappy. It's the flesh that does that. But oftentimes we'll blame the wrong thing. And so the joy of spiritual faith, if you'll turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, we have here the gospel given in the first few verses. This is the resurrection chapter. And, uh, and then we read in verse 5, uh, speaking of the fact that he was uh, he, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures in verse 4, and then verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained unto this present. At the writing of this they were still alive, but some have fallen asleep that were, had died now. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. The Lord Jesus took the time to reveal himself to those who had followed him in his earthly ministry. He is so good to us to substantiate uh, his word and to show the spiritual reality. What the disciples saw in the upper room, the 500 saw. And they realized that Jesus didn't look exactly like he looked before he went to the cross. And it would be to those who would grasp on to the Word of God and realize the victory of Christ and all that had been accomplished and the proof of that by this physical yet glorified uh, Savior that they were seeing as he was, he was still veiled because of their own limitations. But they saw the spiritual reality and there was a great joy that came as they began to comprehend that. G. Campbell Morgan said, what was he doing? He was just demonstrating to them the reality of the resurrection. He was there, the same hands, the same feet. There were wound prints in them. 
Thus they saw that it was actually their master whom they had seen uh, put to death on a Roman gibbet, then determined to make them realize that he said, is there anything here to eat? They found a piece of boil, broiled fish and ate it. Thus he was demonstrating the reality of his personality and the corporal reality of his resurrection. Now let me say this. This occurred to these people at that time. But my friends, as we have the completed word of God, and for every believer here who is determined to know the Lord, just as they were getting thrilled with who Christ was and, and, and what uh, this all meant, God constantly wants to do that for us as we know his word. The more we walk with him, the more we study the word, the more we take the steps of faith and believe him and what he tells us to do and know that the only ground to stand upon is the word of God. As we do that, then that joy of spiritual reality builds in our life. It's not a one-time experience. It's to be an ongoing experience of abiding in Christ. The joy of the Lord. Now go on with G. Campbell Morgan. He says, his resurrection body was no longer limited by the laws that limit the terrestrial body. Personality is not dependent upon identity of material dwelling. None of us has the same body that we had seven years ago. There is not a particle of us here now that was then. We are always fashioning the material dwelling place. In resurrection, there's not merely a change in the body within the same material. There's a change in the character of the material. A body fitted for the higher reaches, but still a body. And so as they began to get a hold of the spiritual reality of a resurrected Savior, they had to tell about it. They were so excited. And friends, I hope you see the connection. So many believers know the facts. There were times when we were excited about those facts and God moved in our life, but we move through life often without walking in the Spirit, allowing God to work in our life. And when we think of needing to tell someone the truth or to help someone, we feel paralyzed because unbelief comes in. We're not thinking spiritually. There isn't illumination there. There isn't the Spirit of God's help. Now, God's always gracious to help us, but that's where a lot of the unbelief comes from. Secondly, and I've already gotten into this, is scriptural thinking uh, is very key. You see, he exposed the blindness of their unbelief. Um, let me start back in verse uh, uh, 42. I left off there. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. He has a physical body today. By the way, we will have fellowship with him and be at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we will have an actual tangible meal with him. Can you imagine? No restaurant can match up to that. I'm telling you, that is going to be quite, quite the meal. It's going to be real too, okay? You're not going to be eating clouds. Get all that stuff out of your mind, okay? Uh, it's going to be very tangible, very real. Take the Bible literally, and uh, it's exciting. But look at verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. He said, You were blind. I told you, I expounded the Old Testament to you. I told you specifically what I was going to do, but you were blind. You know, there's a lot of things, folks, that God wants to tell us, but we don't want to hear it. And boy, that will shut down a good witness if we're not listening to God. Because immediately we lose that joy of walking in the Spirit. Oh, there's things that God wants us to know. There are things that God wants us to do. And there are truths that we need to accept. You know, we have a lifestyle. We have a, a, just a way that we want to live, uh, priorities that we have. And if we really study the Word of God, it's going to confront, we're going to be confronted that it's not exactly right. And when we make the decision not to listen and are blinded, then that unbelief will grip us. You've heard the tragic story in 1970 of that uh, Liberian tanker. I mentioned this just recently. Uh, the Arrow ran um, aground off Nova Scotia, broken two and sunk, and it was a mess. If you remember, 125 miles of shoreland was just 
ruin for a while. And the Greek captain admitted that he did, not, he did see the echo on his radar, but he dismissed it as spurious. That was my mistake, he confessed, but the damage was done. My friends, the Word of God is never spurious. The Word of God is absolutely true. And when the Spirit of God convicts us of that, we need to be listening. And when we do listen, that, that means that we are, are walking by faith and our belief, our belief in Him will be strengthened so that we are not crippled by fear. And uh, he revealed the light of the Old Testament truth, as we saw there in verse 44. Look down at verse 46. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Uh, the Old Testament made it very clear that Christ was going to come and that if they had searched the scriptures, they would have known it to be so. I've mentioned many times I had the privilege from second grade to eighth grade of growing up in, in southwest corner of Colorado, Durango, one of the most beautiful spots in our country. And I loved it. And so whenever we went back, we went back almost every yearly, we would come uh, driving from the east to the, uh, to the border there of uh, uh, from Nebraska into Colorado, and there would be that wooden sign, Welcome to Colorful Colorado. And uh, we would always get out and take a picture of us there at that sign. If you were to look directly west, you still didn't see any mountains. Uh, it's still far enough away. That's a long eastern part of Colorado if you've been on that drive. But we were in Colorado. But you know, we didn't camp there around that sign. We didn't spend the rest of our vacation at the sign of Colorado. No, we kept driving till we really got to see Colorado. The Colorado, I like, you know. You may like the plains, that's fine, but uh, I like the mountains. But the point is, folks, you know, you have your Bible, and you know a few things, and you take a picture with your Bible. Close it. Do you realize the vistas of beauty and understanding that, you, that are in this book? This is the revelation of God perfectly given from the very heart of God to us. And the more we study and allow the Spirit of God to apply the Word of God to us, uh, the more we're going to understand spiritual reality and be absolutely stirred that God is going to work and that we need to get the gospel out. It'll be part and parcel of our life because we are immersed in our, in our mind and heart. Honestly, how little we study the Bible versus how little we study other things in, a, in American Christianity is, is pretty tragic. Folks, we ought to, this ought to be our heart and soul. And uh, we need to realize all that is there. And, of course, uh, he illuminated the truth supernaturally. Uh, again, going to quote from Morgan. He opened their minds. That's what it means there in verse. He opened their understanding. That word opened is a very remarkable word. Uh, the Greek word there means to thoroughly open up. I do not know that there is any word in our language that may help us more than the word disentangled. That is what he did for their minds, freed them from all pride, somehow dealt with their menta mentality so that the picture blurred, instinct out of focus came sharply now into focus. And they saw the whole thing, not in detail, but in sequence. And that's what God wants to do. Folks, he wants us to be spiritually minded and to know the truth. And I'm trying to say, folks, there is more to this matter of not witnessing than just not having a good spiritual discipline. It really does go down to our walk with God. And when we let fear, and when we let these other things stop us from doing what we know we ought to do, we, we need to dig deeper and realize that we do not see Christ and we do not see the truth as we ought to see it. And if we do, then the third point here will motivate us, the sovereign commission. It's right here. This is a commission, one of the great commission passages that we don't often look at. I read the first part of it there in verse 47. Let's look at that again. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, 
beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And so, because of who Christ is, because of the great truth that he has given to us, and, and the fact that he is accomplishing the plan of the ages perfectly, we are now in his plan on April the 7th, 2024. We are right in the middle of what he is doing. And my friends, we are a strategic part of his ministry, just as those disciples were well over 2,000 years ago. We've got to see ourselves from that perspective. This commission is as personal to us as it was to them. And so we need to understand that his purpose is that all people groups uh, from our home area out need to be confronted with the gospel. And this is really the fulfillment of the Old Testament, Isaiah 42, 6, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and, and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light uh, of the Gentiles. And uh, Isaiah 5, 49, 6 says it also, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles. That's all of us, that thou mayest be my salvation until, unto the end of the earth. And uh, what he said here was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 when the Spirit of God did come. Uh, the promise of the Father came upon the disciples and all of us. If you're a believer here today, you are indwelt by the Spirit of God and you can be, if you yield to him, be endued with power from on high just like those disciples back at Pentecost. Remember, it wasn't just the the 11 and then the 12, it was a large group. The 120 were there witnessing at that time. And before long, it was thousands who were witnessing going over all of that area. So he has commissioned us to give the truth. When he met there, another uh, angle on this is from John chapter 20, verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my father hath sent me, even so send I you. I'll stop there. As the Father sent me to save the world, so send I you to get the message out to the world. Well, why don't we? That famous story of the Big Three conference during World War II, Roosevelt, Churchill, were trying to get Stalin to agree with a, a key strategy. And uh, when Stalin gave his reason or excuse for not agreeing with him, they said, that's that is no reason for your refusal. Stalin replied with the story of two Egyptians. One Egyptian asked the other to lend him a rope. The latter replied, I can't. I need it to tie my camel. The first Egyptian reminded his companion that he didn't own a cam camel, to which the companion replied, I know that. But when you don't want to lend your rope, one excuse is as good as another. <laughs> well, when it comes to what the Lord has told us, no excuse is good. Well, I just can't speak to people. You know, I just am not a people person. It's, I've done it and it's not worked. You know, it, that's for others. God will help others, but I, I've not seen him help me. It, all kinds of excuses. But my friend, it simply is a revelation that we don't believe that God can use us. And as I've been looking at this uh, from this passage, that unbelief does come out of, of, a, of a lack of a spiritual reality of who Christ is, what a spiritual walk is, what it means to see him work, what the Spirit of God has been promised to do for us. And so we are looking at it from an earthly perspective instead of from a spiritual perspective. God is wanting to work in our lives. Someone supposed, and of course it would not have been this way, but I think it's, it's, it's um, worth uh, thinking about because it's true in, in the essence of what it says. After Jesus ascended to heaven, someone speculated that uh, the angels asked him, did you accomplish your task? And of course they wouldn't be talking like this. And, but he said, yes, it's all finished. 
And then they said, we have a second question. Has the whole world heard of you? No, said Jesus. The angels next asked, then what is your plan? He said, I've left 12 men and some other followers to carry the message to the whole world. They looked at him and asked, what is your plan B? <laughs> there is no plan B. I'm looking at plan A. All of us. This is it. This is it. And it's enough. In fact, we have more here right now than we're at the time he gave the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. And those people reached the world with far less advantages than we have. Unbelief. Unbelief. Causes us to get the excuses. Causes us to falter. Oh, friends, it really does expose where we are spiritually. And I, I, I get under great conviction myself, and I trust that we all will, about how genuinely we need to walk in the presence of God. For if we have the joy of spiritual reality, we cannot help but speak of those things which we have seen and heard. Let's bow for prayer. <clears throat> As we bow before the Lord, I believe that a message like this is truly on the heart of the Lord Jesus because of uh, all that he did and, he, and the privilege that he has given to us to bear the message and to be his hands, his feet, his eyes, his mouth, to be able to continue on his ministry. And he's given us the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, to be able to accomplish that. And yet, so often we don't. We don't do it. We, are, we live in fear because of unbelief. You say, how do I get over that? By believing God. Just saying, it's not a matter of having some kind of self-will that I'm going to go soul winning. That's not going to do it. What's going to do it is for there to be a d deep desire to know our God and to walk with Him and to, and to understand Him spiritually and to have the joy of the Lord fill our heart and to, and to so walk with him that we cannot help but speak. You'd say this morning, Pastor, I am saved and how deeply, deeply thankful I am for God's goodness to me. If I were to die, I know I'm going to heaven. But I find myself paralyzed at times. I have to admit, at times I make excuses but I realize that it goes deeper than that. It's my walk with God. It's my understanding of who Christ is and, and who he is today to me and all that he's given to me. I have all I, I need to be someone that can affect other people. And I want to be in the center of his plan. I want to walk by faith. Faith comes by knowing the word of God and loving it and accepting it as true. And so you're here as a believer, but you'd say, Pastor, God has dealt with me. I need to get to the place I, I am speaking forth those things that I know to be true in, the, in my heart. And I realize I've not been as I ought. You know, God knows my heart, but I am asking him for his grace. Would you pray for me? With heads bowed, would you just slip your hand up if God has worked in your heart that way? God bless you. Many, many hands. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor, you talked about knowing for sure you're on your way to heaven. Honestly, if I were to die, I would hope I get to heaven. I've tried to be good, try to be religious, but I don't have that full confidence. Friend, that's why Christ came. You can't, can't do it and I can't do it either. No way for us to get into a holy heaven. We're not holy. But he died for us and he bore the judgment for our sins. He satisfied the wrath of the injustice of the Father and rose again to prove it. And, and if you'll simply put your faith in him, his righteousness can be applied to your life and you will then have everlasting life. And you'd say, Pastor, as I'm here this morning, I, I, I am burdened about my eternal destiny. And I would appreciate you praying for me. You know, friend, it's good to admit your need to the Lord. And um, 
and I'm going to ask in just a moment. No one's going to look around. We're not going to point you out. But, you know, this is a, a very strategic time for folks. When God makes things clear, it's a time to respond to him. And you'd say, Pastor, I just don't know about my eternal destiny, and God is working in my heart, and I, I want God to know that I'm burdened about it. And would you pray for me? With no one looking, would you just slip your hand up for a moment until I see it? Yes, God bless you. Thank you. You may put your hand down. Anyone else? God's working in my heart. I'm going to just be honest about it. I don't know what would happen, but I'd like to know. Friend, it's not a church. It's not religious rituals. It's Jesus. He's the one that saves. He's already taken care of it. It's finished, the Bible says. Anyone else? God's working in your heart here this morning. Lord, would you work in each of these hearts? Thank you for uh, what you have done in our lives and how you've brought us together here even today. And Lord, I'm thankful for the many that do know you as Savior. Lord, those that admitted the need and that admitted that unbelief brings fear and disobedience. Uh, Lord, would you give them great victory? Just bless them. Thank you for their openness about that. Lord, for this one that admitted their need of salvation, I'm sure there are others. Lord, would this be the morning that they simply put their faith in you? What a tremendous uh, joy it is to come to know you in saving faith. Make it clear, and uh, would you work in their life? Lord, thank you that we can come to you. Bless now this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. I want to have uh, the piano play as we bow before the Lord. I do want to give you an opportunity here to, uh, to make a decision. Now, we gave, of course, commitment cards to our folks here, and I would encourage you to fill that out. That's a decision itself. And if you didn't put it in the offering plate, give it to guest services and just uh, put uh, a stake in the ground and say, I'm, I'm going to be, I'll work with someone, I'm going to go, and I trust you'll do that. But it may be, Christian, you just need to come and say, Lord, I can't live with this kind of fear. I've got to be living in that spiritual reality. The joy of the Lord needs to be my strength. I need to be a, a, what, know what it really means to abide in you. And God has dealt with me. I would encourage you to come and just, just let God work in your heart. And friends, if you're not certain that you're saved, this church doesn't save, but we have the great privilege of showing you the truth that Jesus does save. And if you'll just simply come forward, the uh, uh, pastors here will have someone show you from the Word of God how you can get that matter settled today. It'd be our privilege to help you. So as the piano plays, if God's working in your heart, you come now at this time. Thank you. You may be seated. In just a moment, we're going to have baptism. However, we do want to give one certificate of completion for uh, discipleship. The first level of discipleship, the Connection Bible study, has been completed by Winshaw Hong. And if you'll come forward, and then the Youngs also, I believe, uh, uh, discipled them. So if you folks uh, all would like to come forward at this time, it's always a joy to uh, see... Uh, these discipleship lessons completed. 
and we have a book there that'll be a, a help. So, uh, brother, we're so thankful for your faithfulness there. And it's been exciting to see God working. Let's give Winshaw a, a round of applause. God bless you. That's tremendous. All right, lead us in the hymn as we're getting ready here. Prepare for baptism this morning. And uh, let's take our hymn books, please. Sing a few verses of a song that we heard the choir sing earlier. And I think very uh, good for us this, this morning. I love to tell the story. 431 in your hymn books. 431. I love to tell the story. It will be my theme in glory. And stay seated as we sing. I love to Baptism does not save. It is the beautiful picture of our identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and is a testimony that a person has been saved and identifies with the people of God. We have uh, 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 Liam Wayne, uh, who uh, was saved back in 2019, and uh, he's been in our academy really right from the beginning, I believe. And uh, we're so glad, Liam, that you want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. We thank God for you. All right, let's step down. In obedience to our Lord's command and upon your profession of your faith in the Savior, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, next we have Alyssa Eichler, and, excuse me, you said it right. 
Did I say it right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's always the fun thing is pronouncing things right here. And uh, she was saved back in 2022, October the 30th. And uh, she has been real faithful over these last months here. She really has a desire to go forward uh, in the Lord. We thank God for that. We thank God for your testimony. Amen. In obedience to our Lord's command and upon your public profession of your faith in the Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. All right, and next we have Dakota Rubel, and she was saved back in spring of 2016, but now wants to follow the Lord and and uh, fulfill really her testimony of the Lord. You're glad you're saved, Dakota. I am. God bless you. Amen. In obedience to our Lord's command, upon your public profession of your faith in the Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for these. Let me just mention tonight we will be preaching back in our First Corinthians series one of the most interesting sections of 1 Corinthians, and uh, we're looking at chapter 8, and I trust you can be with us for the service tonight. For a closing word of prayer, thankful for what God has done this morning. Lord, thank you so much for the way you've worked in our hearts. Thank you so much that we can worship you. Lord, thank you so much that we have a story to tell. Help us to be obedient. Help us to believe that you can work through our lives. Help us to be right with you this week. Help us to have your power and a testimony of who you are this week, wherever we may go. I pray you bless and strengthen you know, the people that are here, these people of our church, and I pray this community will not be the same even after this week. I pray you'd help us to come back tonight as a, as a, a church family and uh, really learn from you, worship you tonight. We thank you for what you're going to do and what you have done in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>